think about it like a backpack. Grief is like this too. You can fill the backpack with anything. So you always will have a backpack on your back every single day. Someday that backpack has pebbles in it. And someday my backpack has boulders in it. And sometimes it's in between with bricks. It tends to not be the boulders that push me over. It tends to be the bricks. <laughs> because I That's feel like I carry the bricks longer. A boulder is, gosh, I had a crappy day. Yeah. And Let's if I have a rule, day. if I get up the following morning and it's still bothering me, I give myself 24 hours to clear it with that person. <laughs> Welcome to Mosaic Minds, the podcast where every episode is a colorful blend of perspectives, ideas, and conversation. Each week, our diverse team of hosts brings their unique backgrounds, experiences, and interests to the table. Mosaic Minds is your invitation to join the conversation to see the world through a kaleidoscope of viewpoints. So grab a seat, tune in, and let the mosaic unfold before you. Welcome back to another episode of Mosaic Minds Podcast. I'm Nick, and to my left here is my co-host, Jason. And we are bringing back uh, one of our beloved guests, Dr. Julie Bosler. Uh, last time, we, we're going to kind of continue on with our uh, part two of our series on mental health awareness and uh, different topics like that. And then this time, we actually got a list of questions from viewers on some things that maybe they would like to dis to discuss or some of them were, were quite specific. So we'll also go down through that list. But uh, Julie, I know that you uh, you did this last time, but if you could just kind of, for people that maybe didn't catch the, the part one, could you kind of uh, give a little bit about your background and uh, kind of kind of how, kind of how recap of how we did the, the first episode? Sure. And um, Nick and Jason, thanks again for bringing me back. Sure. What an honor. I mean, a two-time guest. Hey, <laughs> I know, no, right? <laughs> it's not me this way, right? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm really excited So um, to be back. And and thank you to your um, to your listeners and, and people who were really took this topic serious. So um, my background is in higher education. I have been a college president for five years. Prior to that, I was a college vice president of academics. And, um, and prior to that, a, a community college professor and a dean. So um, I have worked in the sector um, of higher education for quite a while. I um, realized um, in about prior, right before the pandemic, that um, I was, I was struggling. Uh, I was trying to keep things together in my uh, personal life, being the mom of two girls and uh, now two young women and uh, being a wife and um, also being a college president and really working through the dynamics of feeling like um, I wasn't giving enough to everything. I, what, I needed to be more, do more, which led me down a road of really self-realization to realize that um, I had developed an anxiety disorder. And in that anxiety disorder, I, I learned that anxiety and depression are married to one another. So you can't separate one from the other. They, they, they travel as a duo and they're a terrible duo to experience. But um, I was so high functioning with it that I didn't have the type of symptoms of um, that, that, that seemed to interfere with my daily life if you didn't know. Right. In other words, I was highly functioning as a college president, highly functioning um, as a mom at my daughter's high school volunteering. I was a um, highly functioning neighbor, a community member. Uh, uh, I was in a girls group that went out and did dinner and movies and, um, but I found in that high functioning that I somehow lost control of my own life and my own um, priorities of where I wanted my life to be and how I wanted my priorities 
to be healthy. Somehow that had all sort of fallen by the wayside for me. And so I began this journey with a therapist realizing what had led me to this road and what I needed to do really to get back on track. And um, one of that um, ideas was self-awareness, but also was sharing my story. The Jerry Maguire moment. (laughs) <laughs> yes, the Jerry Maguire moment, as we talked about on the last episode. And, you know, really coming forward and saying, it's okay in today's world to be a leader, to to be um, a leader in higher education. You fill in the blank, a leader in blank. And um, to lead a team of people in your daily life, but also to admit to those people, um, I need help. I'm struggling. And I need to get myself better to be the best version of myself, to make myself healthy enough, to love myself enough to be able to do my job. But I have to put myself first. And so that's really what led to the heart of, of this situation. And, um, and it led me to a lot of self-discovery with my own family and a lot of self-discovery with my students as well. Yeah, one of the things I love about this topic and the candor that that we both have is I think that a lot more people than than we would ever realize that this hits hits home with. You know, like I, there's a lot of episodes when I'm when I'm editing that you know like I I have a real personal feeling toward them, but this one in particular when I watched it, there was a couple of parts where I was like <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, I'm just like, man, it's, you know, like it really, really got me, you know, like the part where you were talking about, um, about your, uh, your kids and, and, you know, like, hey, let's, let's just, let's not tell, tell your friends, you know, like that part when, yeah, it really got me. I watched it a couple times, actually that part. <laughs> but, yeah. I, I, I had a moment where I had this, this, this interesting realization too, that, um, you know, I needed to be truthful to my daughters because what I had done is I was a master at hiding what I was going through. So at home, I was being myself. I was, uh, my daughters would see me crying, uh, blowing something out of proportion, um, needing to get to bed early, being so fatigued, so exhausted. Um, and seeing me come from a college event straight to a therapy session, straight to this, going to the pharmacy, uh, starting to take medication um, for anxiety, all of this. And what I suddenly realized is, is by being open and free and truthful, it allowed me to not shame my daughters because One of the worst things we can do is we don't realize as parents that our children, no matter what the age in their adolescent stage, as their brain's developing, as their feelings, their emotions, their life stages they're in. At the time, I had a young, um, fairly young teenager and an older teenager, two daughters. And I suddenly had this epiphany that um, statistically, one of them may very well have mental health issues. Sure. And that by hiding it, wearing a mask every day, not a COVID mask, a literal, you know, a mask of a interpretive mask of and hiding what I was going through and shaming myself was only teaching them that if something like that occurred to them to react the same way, because, um, young daughters will model their, their mothers. And, um, and so I suddenly realized what I was setting up for their adult life. Right. And that was a very tender moment. And, and I, the, the comment you were referring to was when I speak about this nationally to anybody who will listen, and I love to speak about to anybody who will listen, because I say, if one person has the courage to make a change for themselves, then it, then it's working. Right. But um, I, I always show a picture of my daughters and I say, I, I, I did it for them. I did yeah. it for myself, but I did it for them because I want them as healthy, young adult women to understand that their mental health 
needs to be a top priority in their mental wellness and they never have to shame themselves for what any for what they're going through anything that happens right where, where do you think the line i was thinking about this the other day but where do you think the line is where and i don't mean this insensitive at all because i probably have a I could probably have several diagnoses, you know, but like, what do you think that the, the, where the line is where some people, cause you hear a lot of the buzzwords from everyone like, Oh, you know, like it, it's triggering my anxiety, but a lot of kids that say that don't even know what anxiety is, you know? So where do you think the line is of using it as a, as a crutch versus, um, versus actually being open and coming out about it? Yeah, I think that's a good, I, I think that's a, a, a good question. And, and, you know, what's interesting about it in my journey is um, I'm, I'm on the other side of the line. I, I'm thinking there's nothing wrong with me. Um, you know, I'm convincing myself that I'm fine. I think that line becomes of not using it as a crutch is when you realize your your self-worth of what you gifts you have to offer to other people is in question. Yeah. And it's holding back your, holding back your gifts because of, because of that. I'm a believer that we are put, regardless of what people believe, you know, evolution, creation, this, that I'm a believer that we are on earth purposefully to, to give, to give to others. And, and I, I think we all have gifts in different ways of being able to do that, whether that be, you know, financially. Sometimes students will say, well, what's the point of a college degree? And I'll say, well, it doesn't necessarily make you smarter than someone who doesn't have one. It might afford you opportunities faster to be financially sound, to give back in that way. Right. So many times colleges will reach out to a young audience of their recent graduates and want money to, you know, to, can you donate money for an alumni scholarship or whatever? And I always tell students that might not be where you're at two years after graduation, yeah. but there's always a gift you can give like helping, helping um, very recently um, a cashier in Target, look at a first generation college student. I looked at her schedule um, to make sure she knew I was a higher ed administrator and she wasn't coming to my college, but she wanted to make sure she was taking the right classes and she knew the Target she worked at was the one I shopped at and she waited for me. And so when she saw me, <laughs> she's like, hey, I know who you are and I know you know a lot about higher ed. Can you look at the schedule I've picked out at the local community college? She wanted an advising session. That's a gift of being able, it's a small gift. It's free. It takes me what, 15 minutes out of my life to do that. I sat down and looked and I said, this looks like a, a really good schedule. Let's make sure, you know, you've got your work hours balanced and you're not overloaded. And so I, I use that not for a hero badge. I use that as a small example of how we can, we have small gifts to give. But when you're going through a mental health situation and you can't use it for a crutch is when it affects the gifts you can give to others. That makes sense. Yeah. And I, I don't always know that that's vocal or silent. It tends to be, in my experience, people will shame themselves into not wanting to disclose it. Mm -hmm. I know because I did that. I was so afraid of what people would think of me. And when I turned that around with something my counselor said, I loved this. Um, and I tell my students this, it's none of my business what people think of me. Right. I want to say that again. It's none of my business what people think of me. It is my business that I am living my life on target to be a good human and to give back to mankind. Right. Looking for those gifts and that purpose. So being in admissions, you're very inspirational in the fact that, you know, you're a leader of the college, you're a leader in the sector and that you're very open about that. I think that's the first inspiration. I want to share with you just a real quick story off the beaten path here. Nick and I had the blessing to speak with somebody today that was, um, it was an interesting situation. I want to tell you, the first episode and the second episode is a continuation of this. We had a young man that didn't need to be out of school 
for X amount of time. We needed to get him started sooner because he needed a rock and a solace and a family to speak on. So I've been seeing it a lot in admissions lately. You've got a heart doctor that's saving a life, but you have an administrator that's changing a life. Speak on that a little bit about the armor that you have to wear, but also changing that life, saying something uplifting, giving them some hope, giving them some solace in your communication with that student. I know that's a loaded question, but speak on that just a little bit for me from your side of the desk. No, I, I appreciate that, Jason. And and, and, he, and here's what I always say. I think not just in advising, but let's use that as an example of humankind. We make Humankind does. We make large assumptions. Okay, so think about um, think about when you're in a grocery store. Let's take that for example, and then we'll talk about how that relates to students. Think about four people in line in a grocery store, and you and you're waiting in line, and you look around, and someone in front of you is taking out every bit of change they can at the grocery store, and they're counting out the money. What's the automatic assumption? Do you think? that they that they're poor uh-huh they're poor they're broke okay could just be that they've been carrying a lot of change in their purse Try to change, yeah. in their, you know there's a million things that could have led to that um i had i used a bunch of change one time at uh wendy's to to get something to eat because i had had quarters rolled for my daughter when she went to college thinking that they would use that she would use those all the time. I spent a whole year collecting quarters from everybody at work and I rolled them all because she was going to need them for a washer and dryer. She brought them all back home. She's like, it takes a card. It doesn't even take change. <laughs> Made the same oh. mistake. <laughs> right. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. now I've got like $50 yeah. in quarters and the bank, you know, what am I going to do? Just go cash them in. So I hear I'm spending and, and it's funny because the assumption, I, I think that's just a small assumption. Um, Another example is a person who is um, coughing right after COVID. Everybody yeah. that accidentally had a cough in their throat that wasn't wearing a mask was putting everybody at risk. Yeah. You know, so we could go on and on with these assumptions that we make. We do the same thing with not only humankind, but students. We make the assumption that when everybody comes to college to start a new journey, we base that on us, that assumption on our own college experience or on someone's experience we know. Here's a great example. My college experience, I was fortunate and I've never pretended not to be that way. My parents paid for my education. They said as long as I continuously went through, they would pay for it. I would come out debt free. They kept their word. That is not the assumption of most students coming in, they've got school loans, alternative loans, you name it, et cetera. And so our assumption of how a college student enters, we only have our own experiences, right? To go yeah. off of. Mm -hmm. Some people come to college exactly what you said. We can't imagine that one person's reasoning maybe to enroll in college is to have an opportunity for five hours a day or during class to have a roof over their head, a steady roof, to get out of a household situation, um, or to be around a community of people who would share food. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't think about those situations. Have I ever, you know, if I needed food when I was in college, I called my parents. They gave me money to buy food. And when you don't have those experiences, the same thing is true with mental health. You know, when you have an experience and you are trying to walk through to get to the root of someone's problem in advising, I think we tend to make a mistake of where we old school advise, where we're so caught up on somebody getting in the right program, getting to class on time, getting there, doing well in the class, that we don't stop to think about what are the factors that have led to that advisement in the first place. Yeah. Case in point. I had a student that was caught cheating. And my example to, to my academic team is this. No one wakes up in the morning in college, especially not in a high stakes nursing program and says, you know, I think I'm going to try to cheat today where I can see if I'll get away with it. 
that sounds like fun to put my whole college career in jeopardy. The advisement should not be so solely focused on first on the crime. Okay. On the, look, you do something wrong, you're going to pay what I call stupid tax for it. But really what the opportunity there is to say, what led you to this in the first place? Right. What's the root? Yeah. What, what's caused you to be in my office today with a disciplinary problem? What's caused you to lash out to your instructor in front of the whole class? That's not who you are. That's not who you want to be. No one wakes up and wants to be the worst version of themselves. Mm -hmm. No one wakes up and wants to be the most depressed version of themselves. No one wakes up and wants to be the anxiety driven version of themselves or even the addicted version, addiction of something version of themselves. Yeah. If people knew how to get past it, they would. Where I think we miss the boat with humankind, students, as a great example is, and the example you gave me, is I don't think we always realize before we even get to what happened, what caused you to get out on that ledge in the first place? And what immediate help can I give you to stop the crisis in its tracks? And what help can we get you going forward? Those are two very powerful questions. What do you need right now to stop it in its tracks? And what do you need in the future to prevent it from happening to you again to get you on the right path? I love your ability to pump the brakes on business mode and go into, you know, like, okay, let's look at the individual, you know, like from several of the stories that you shared. But I want to, I want to jump into, a, so we, we had a requested on our Reddit page that uh, we got some questions for people that had watched the first part for the second part. So I want to jump into a couple of those and interesting right. enough the the first one i want to do it's not wasn't the first question we got but i thought this was i mean it, it couldn't be more perfect for you dr bosler but it says this is from um a co- and i told everyone to keep themselves anonymous so there's no names right. or places or anything like that but it just says this is from a college administrator and okay, it says <clears throat> dr bosler in your experience what are some practical things colleges can implement to create a more proactive approach to mental health rather than waiting for a crisis and that went perfectly into kind of what we talked about in part one so i thought I'd let you expand on that well first of all let me just say to that college administrator thank you for that question the fact that you're asking that question um already tells me that you're a college administrator that's thinking yeah outside the box on, on being, and I love when I hear being proactive, not reactive. Mm -hmm. So um, excellent idea. I think what we, what we have to do is, um, is create opportunities for students to break stigmas. So one of the ways, instead of trying to bring students into a group and forcing them to share personal stories that, because not everybody has that comfort level. Where it starts is think about flipping it to the celebrations. So for example, for this college administrator, when a student scores, let's say if any, you fill in the blank with any kind of exam, a license exam, just a, a, an exam at the end of the quarter or semester in a class that's difficult and a student scores really high and does really well, I think what's interesting is to turn that celebration into saying, what were the hardships you had in getting here? Like sometimes that hardship may be, well, I had to take four nights off from work to study. Sometimes it can be, I had to sacrifice, my husband had to sacrifice letting me go to school first. Every victory has a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You purposely have chosen to do well in something. People who don't do well in something, either they don't give it full attention or they can't. And so finding out, helping people celebrate the wins and looking at the adversity that was behind the wins is a really, I don't want to say clever, but is a really neat way 
to bring up the topics of and get to the heart of, you know, I I got to be honest with you. I had I panicked two nights before the exam. I didn't think I knew the material. You know, there's ways in engaging people to talk about it. Another thing I think is peers like to learn from their peers. So when I spoke to um, college administrators, I liked saying, I'm one of you. I'm, I'm a college president. And I believe in telling you the truth. I believe in telling my people the truth. Um, I think letting a peer who's, who's come above and risen above the waters and stayed afloat is a great peer to tell a story. I know what it's like. My first year here, I was drowning. I like to say a rising tide lifts all ships. Yep. Yeah. So if you think about it in a rising tide lifting all ships, one person's accomplishment opens the door to have conversations about the adversities and the hard things that people accomplished to have that celebration in the first place. That's a back back doorway to get to it. Another way is um, also creating things. I think we're especially good in our sector of having classes that prepare students for how to study, how to learn, um, buying books, you know, orientation. What if orientation had resources right off the bat for students that they could grasp and get their hands on 24 mm seven. -hmm. Yeah. One thing that, one thing that myself and our uh, bursar started doing at our campus is, you know, there's always the problem of the students that are behind on their payments and that sort of thing. So normally she has to play, you know, the bad guy and, and go and, you know, bring them down to her office. Hey, you're behind on your payments. We need you to write a check, you know, that sort of thing. But we started doing, as an institution, all departments are kind of starting to try to think a little bit more outside of the box and come up with uh, some, some, some different solutions than what have been used in the past. And instead of trying to necessarily, now don't get me wrong, we're still a business, so we have to, we have to right. get the money. But we, uh, instead of focusing primarily on that, instead we figured that is a good red flag to talk to them about what else is going on in your life that before you were able to make those payments and what now happened? and now you're not you know like whether that's uh you know just irresponsible spending maybe you have a habit you know maybe there's something something else there so you know that's that's something and i like i said i think a lot of our departments and including admissions i think have tried to brainstorm into other other routes to the same solution yes and i would tell you uh, um, I, th I love that idea. I think it's great because you're right. Someone not paying their bill, someone doesn't wake up as an adult and say, you know, I think it would be neat to see how long it would be before our electricity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a fun game. We should play that. No one does that. Instead, what we need to be asking is exactly that. Hey, you've seemed to be a responsible and paying What's happened? What, again, go back to what can we stop right now? And what can we get you on a plan to help you going forward? Um, the other thing I would say, too, that's that's kind of a neat idea, the idea of food pantries. And we've had this, but students often become ashamed to or think it marks them to go inside a food pantry. So I would tell you to what's interesting about um, our employees, we will do like Broncos because we're in Denver, a Broncos um, dress up day. Although we know we're 0 and 2, we're not talking about that right now. Um, <laughs> but we might have a, a Broncos day and everybody can donate a canned food. We t tend to donate staples that will be good. We, every at the end of the month, when people get tough on money for no reason, we set out peanut butter and jelly and loaves of bread. We do that too. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And people can make sandwiches. But have you ever thought about putting a little care package of some groceries, some cans of soup and things around the campus in a box? And people and students can just pick the box up, 
drop it into their backpack. They don't even have to go into a food pantry. So for us, that might be on the shelf. It's not like a scavenger hunt. They're pretty, we'll put one in the study rooms and we might monitor it and we see it's gone and we've got another box. So we might put 20 boxes of food out around the campus. One might be right outside of the bathroom under the water fountain. Places that you know students are going to go and it says free, take what you need. Yeah. 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 We have, we've, yeah, we, we have a lot of, we're a, you know, our school, our students are mechanics and we have a lot of veterans, <coughs> excuse me. So we've had um, students in the past that have literally, we didn't know it at the time, but we literally have been homeless, you know, that live, we're right. living, living out of their van. I think maybe even in, in our parking lot, I don't know, but like at right. least, at least somewhere nearby, you know? So yeah, something like that. You're right though. Ego plays a huge, a huge part. It in that does, kind of thing. you know, grabbing a box of rice and a can of chicken, canned chicken. I can put that in my backpack and no one knows. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. You yep. know, being able to, to pack small items and toss that into my backpack that can just give somebody just a hair of a break. Yeah. Um, so I, I think those are clever ways on every campus to be able to do that and to have those resources set up. I, I like to helped. say uh, the rocks and the roads are overcome and become stepping stones to success is kind of the cliche that I use. So say I come to your office and I'm struggling and let's just say it's not just one thing. Let's say I've got two or three struggles, but let's say the next person you talk to is complaining because they got a 96% on a test and they thought they would get a hundred percent. How do you break down the initial conversation of that person that you're in front of real time, as opposed to just kind of a blanket statement. And then I'm going to turn it back over to Nick and he's going to knock out the next question. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I think that's a good question. I mean, so I always, I tell students to, um, cause we teach them a hierarchy. So these are going to be nursing graduates. So they don't start at the CNO because I'm also trying to teach them to be um, good stewards of conflict resolution. We don't have a problem with another student in our class and run to the college president. It's not that I don't want to see them. It's just not how that's going to work in, in a hospital. You're not going to have a problem with another nurse and run to the chief nursing officer. It's just not going to work. So we need to be teaching them soft skills of conflict resolution. I find that those moments for me happen not in my office. They happen with me at the ground level um, in talking with people organically. So out of my five-day work week, I make a point to not schedule three of those days during 12 to 1 where I can eat lunch at the kitchen counter in the student's kitchen. So it's not happening where appointments are made, where it's generalized talk. It's, hey, you look down today. Hey, you've been crying. What's going on? You've been crying. Let's take a walk. We're going to walk outside together. Those are those moments. Um, how do you decipher the difference? I think someone's um, crisis can be anything from I'm having a crisis over making a B instead of an A yeah. versus I don't have enough gas to get home. Yep. Mm -hmm. Those seem like almost silly crises to compare against each other, but there's more behind the, if someone's making a B and they're fretting over an A, that tends to be an anxiety issue. Yeah. That tends to, that, that, that's a student that needs a reminder. You're enough. Mm -hmm. You and are it, enough. So you are all, all perspective to too. You know, all perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, I I don't ever try to want to minimize someone's problems because that may be the worst thing that's happened in their life. Where we might think that's nothing. You know, like I, I've yeah. I've been through this, 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 and this. But for them, if that's the worst thing they've ever been through, then you know, it's the end of the world for them right then. So you know, that's right. even when it comes to I try to be sympathetic when it comes to my kids and like breakups and things like that, because, you know, it may seem silly to, to us because they're, you know, they're, they're kids, but to them, it's, you know, it's the end of the world. It is. And I think, I think giving them the coping skills, you're not giving them to them. They have them. You're reminding them they have them. Yeah. Right. You know, like, oh my gosh, 
if someone can't see your value and self-worth of what you're going to be, they just did you a favor. Mm-hmm. You're going to, th- you're going to be thankful for this in six months. Yep. And then remembering that another good way too is, and this happens at smaller schools, our school, especially, of course, I park in the student parking lot. I, 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 they know my car. I know what people drive. I know, I don't always know which student has which car, but I make a point to put a, a note card that says you're doing great today on someone's car. Nursing school's hard. You're crushing it. Those are free, easy ways on a note card to say you're 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 really doing some terrific things, and and sometimes that small note keeps people going. Sure. Yeah, I just... also wanted to say one other thing because I don't want to forget to say this. Our state has it as a requirement, but if any of the college administrators are listening and they don't have this as a requirement in their state, I love that. Our I was. I voted, I was a big proponent of yes, yes, yes for this legislation. But um, our state, on the back of every student ID, you have to have the your state crisis uh, Colorado um, suicide line. Yeah, I like that. It's on the back of every student ID. Where do I get immediate help? It's always on the back of your student ID. And I would highly recommend that's a proactive step Mm -hmm. because you can't predict when a student needs that, but they know it's on the back of their student ID. Yeah, I like that. The national hotline as well. I put that. Yeah, I was thinking, I know you told that story at the conference. And so I, I made, I don't know if you watched the video to the end, but I made sure to put at the very end, um, the idea, yeah, the suicide crisis hotline. Exactly. All right. So the next one, it says, I assume that, that they're talking about me because I don't think you mentioned this, but uh, it says you mentioned that men often find it hard to admit when they need help. As a guy, I feel like I'm supposed to always have it together. What's your advice for men who are struggling but don't want to be seen as weak? Wow, that's a great question. I love, there is a series, a PSA series uh, that came out and um, they were PSAs talking about men, and men find their mental, statistically again, statistically speaking, find their mental health struggles in the age bracket of uh, uh, late 30s into their uh, mid to upper 50s. And one of the reasons is, is again, by that point, you're supposed to be in a stable job, a sta- the provider of a you know, helping be provider of the strong person in your family. We have these particular, I think, um, cultural expectations. I always think when men can bring other men into the circle to get the conversation started, that is a wonderful way to broach that subject. Because What happens, I think, is that it's not that men don't suffer the same mental health. It's not that they don't need the same mental health or mental wellness. I think what happens is, is women tend um, to find support groups easier or a group of people, you know, my husband has got a group of golf friends that probably doesn't seem to be the topic that would come up in a game of golf. (laughs) But what if that golf game ended up in a, a Bible study, a study of um, travel and culture that a group had in common. I love for um, a board game, a card game, a, a guy's night out to the Rockies, the Colorado Rockies baseball. There's a lot of ways I think of engaging people and just asking who wants to bring a topic to the forefront and talk about how hard it is to be a father. Mm-hmm. To be a husband, to be a partner, to be a straight man, to be a gay man, to be a non-binary, to be anything. It, it's hard enough in our life just to get up every day and to live and to help others. But I think men and women both need to have a safe zone of people. I like what my best friend says. My One of my very best friends is a nurse. And she always says, 
you don't have to uh, you don't have to have 475 Facebook or Instagram followers. You just need one really good friend. Yeah. I like that too. That's good. I think the analogy I'm going to use with you is because being from Colorado, just to throw it out at you, I've been to Keystone several times, Copper Mountain. Love Colorado, by the way. The air just feels fresher in Colorado. I know you know what I'm talking about there with all the pine trees and stuff. You literally almost breathe like a like a menthol, but kind of random. I think what I'm going to tell you is on a very personal note, to me, it's the summit of a mountain. If I allow stuff to build up on me and my personal life's not going well, I'm not eating right, I'm not exercising, I'm going to be brutally honest with you. It rears its ugly head with me and it's it's a more of a mental grind and maybe I'm not as accommodating as I should be, as nice as I should be. But when everything's hitting all the cylinders, exercise is my uh, defense mechanism, if you will, because when I exercise, my mind's fresh the very next day, I'm energized. How do you kind of keep... Um, in your position and you know, you have X and I've mentioned Y, meaning like the, you know, it's there, but you kind of manage it. How do you kind of stay on the strong side to where, um, you're more gravitating towards day-to-day ops as opposed to, Hey, maybe I'm struggling X. But before you answer that, that actually goes perfectly with this next question. So let's, I'm going to okay. read this question and then you can kind of okay. perfect answer them both. I didn't together. look over at his screen, by the way, yeah, just so you cheater. know. <laughs> <laughs> he did wake up this morning wanting to cheat. <laughs> All right. So it says, okay, this is someone who has uh, apparently been in therapy for a little while. And it says, mm-hmm. yeah, it says, I've been in therapy for years, but I still have days when I feel overwhelmed and like I'm not making any progress. How do you deal with the setbacks in your in your own mental health journey, especially after you've been doing the work for so long? Yeah, so tying both of your thoughts together. Therapy and um, medication does not... I, I liked what my doctor said when I got on Lexapro. This doesn't... This isn't going to take it away. This takes your irrational process to handle it away. This gives you back your rational thought process. So do I still have hard days? Oh my gosh, absolutely. But I think the difference is the days don't necessarily, it doesn't take the bad days away. What it helps and what therapy or reminders for me, what it helps is it reminds me that I'm better equipped to handle it. So there have been times where I've been out of therapy for maybe a year and I'm, and I'm okay. I was fine. I was, I was, I was doing really well. I was going, um, and then my father died, you know, May, 2023. And I was well enough equipped to know I'm not in crisis mode. I'm handling this, but before I start getting out of scope, and start walking, taking two steps back and four steps forward, and then taking eight steps back and two steps forward. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put myself back in therapy, and um, I'm just gonna talk out how I feel about losing my father, and about how that leaves my mother, and how I need to process this. Again didn't need to stay in therapy a long time. I know that I have that capability to step in and out. I would tell you, um, I tend to know it's coming when I start to worry about things I can't control. So um, that's a big indicator for me. Hmm. I think I don't look at it anymore as I'm stepping backwards. I look at it as, how can I better equip myself to get through it without struggling about things I can't control for five nights in a row and only spending this one night? So in other words, think about it like a backpack. Grief is like this too. You can fill the backpack with anything. So you always will have a backpack on your back every single day. Someday that backpack has pebbles in it. And someday my backpack has boulders in it. And sometimes it's in between with bricks. 
it tends to not be the boulders that push me over. It tends to be the bricks <laughs> because I feel like I carry the bricks longer. A boulder is, gosh, I had a crappy day. Yeah. And if I have a rule, if I get up the following morning and it's still bothering me, I give myself 24 hours to clear it with that person. So that's a coworker. If I wake up 24, if I wake up the next morning and it still is eating at me, I'm going to have that talk. If it's an argument with my husband, if I still feel that way, 12 hours, within 12 hours, we have a rule. We talk it out within 12 hours. If we both still, I call it still feeling yucky. Um, and so that keeps the, the, that starts to unload the bricks. It's when I'm somewhere in between the boulder and the pebbles that things come off the rail for me. For me, it's, it, it will be uncontrollable crying. Absolutely uncontrollable crying. And when I feel that starting to come on, I get it out of the way, but I make my rule be the next morning, I've got 12 hours to clear the bricks out of my backpack. Not all of them. I need to get it back down to a pebble. Okay. And that has worked for me really well to also see the fact that this person who's asked this question, had they not been in therapy, they probably wouldn't be able to take their own bricks out. That's true. Because your therapist does it for you. You right. get your backpack down to pebbles, then you get loaded with bricks and boulders, and it becomes your opportunity, the life you save may be your own. It's your opportunity to take out your bricks one by one, but you get better equipped at doing it. And build up your muscle, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay, so the, I'm, I'm going to have to assume, too, that this next one, this is this is from a teacher, but I'm thinking it's probably not a college professor or adjunct faculty because okay. it says uh it says i've been a teacher for years and i'm noticing more and more students dealing with anxiety and depression how can faculty support students without overstepping boundaries that's a great question <clears throat> so think about and i love this question and thank you to whoever submitted it we do have to be careful about boundaries because at the end of the day when i'm talking to a student I always say, I can get you help. I'm not a licensed therapist to help you. You know, I can help you find your way. There is a fine line about, especially in secondary, elementary, secondary education, we want to be careful of walking that fine line. But giving students creative mechanisms to have that topic. Mm -hmm. So think about in teaching a class. When you're teaching a class, even if it's a math class, if it's a mathematical problem, if it's an English class and you're writing a paper, um, if it's an art class, whatever class, um, it's really an interesting thing. I do this sometimes when I speak to college faculty and I teach them about how to engage students. And I say, I send students up to a whiteboard. We used to say chalkboards, it's irrelevant now, but we send them to a whiteboard with a marker. Draw how you're feeling today. What does that look like? What does draw how you're feeling look like? And when you start by going saying, draw love on the board. And pe most people will draw a heart. Well, that's a heart, but what does love look like? And students will say, well, I don't know. Okay, draw anger on the board. So start by having people draw emotions on the board. And people realize, well, I can't draw how I feel on the board. Yeah, but you're drawing imagery that shows how you feel. So mm -hmm. you go up to the board, you draw an emotion on the board. And the emotion may be a ball. I loved what a student did one time. It was a ball hitting a wall. And I said, what, what, what is your drawing? And it was a freshman in freshman composition. And the student said, I'm drawing a ball. This is a ball hitting a wall. And that opened up a conversation. So um, after class, I sent an email and I said, hey, I saw, I, I saw your drawing. I thought it was really an interesting concept. I've never seen a student do that before. And just wanna let you know if that ball in any way represents what you're feeling right now, my door's open. 
Um, I think giving people the okay to feel safe to want to come to somebody is not the same as being intrusive and saying, I think you have a problem. Someone yeah. who's drawing a ball on a wall on a, a whiteboard is not, is not, you're not diagnosing them with anxiety. What you're doing is saying, hey, you're safe. I like to tell students, this is safe. You're in a safe place. Learning in an institution, rather whatever institution it should be, should be safe. And I don't mean just shootings. I mean safe mentally, emotionally, physically, all across the board to have a safe place for people to feel like they have value. Sometimes people just want to be heard too. You know, they just want someone to listen. I have, I have certain friends that I go to for advice and then I have certain friends that I go to to vent, you know, to vent to, because I know that they'll just listen, you know, cause if, if I go to the ones that give me advice, they're going to piss me off. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> if I'm just trying to vent. That's a good friend. <laughs> you, you brought you know, up I a great, you're... You brought up oh, a great gorgeous. point about, um, you know, the golf course because I'm a sports guy, but I, I'm not ashamed to admit this. You know, as guys, I fish a lot. I play pickleball. I play basketball. I've been around sports my whole life. But what I'm saying is during that sporting event, even if somebody's struggling, I'm going to be brutally honest with you. It's hard to stop at hole three and ask somebody, are they okay? But what right. I want to share with you that I think is interesting and uh, with that with that format of my point of view the videos that are bringing me to tears right now are the videos of the administrators that pull a young man or a young woman aside and they're filming it for the right reason, not the wrong reason. Like the other day, a gentleman was walking with three toes out and I don't even know if I want to call it a shoe. I would call it a shoe sandal hybrid, but it was because he didn't have enough money. And the administrator simply said, look, we're getting you a nice quality pair of shoes. They already knew the student student's shoe size, what I'm trying to say is I think there's got to be more of that male or female administrator school. And I think the students could also realize that it's okay to bring X to that person anonymously and not make, cause I I'm a conservative person. The fact that I don't want to make a big production out of that. That's just me. I want to kind of anonymously make sure that that person can do that. Cause I think if we, if we're all strong or getting through that day, I think the success rates go up, the happiness goes up, the camaraderie goes up. You know, just to share with you off topic a little bit, I saw some kids throwing football the other day. Well, I speed out of there at six because I'm ready to start my night. I'm going to bring shorts and a t-shirt and I'm going to throw some football with these guys so they can laugh at me of how I can't throw anymore because I'm older. But build that camaraderie, build that bridge. I think that's what um, an A-plus application is as opposed to just going by day to day. There's so many opportunities, and we talked about this in the last podcast. There's so many opportunities that we know something's not right with the person, but we are scared to stop. We're scared of being rejected. That's our biggest fear. We're scared of failing as humans and being rejected as humans. And when you try to take those two dynamics out of your mind, if you ask somebody, you don't look well right now, is, is everything okay? You know, I've seen people on a phone before in the store and they're crying. And I go, hey, I know you're on the phone. You don't look well. Everything okay with you? Anything I could do right now to immediately help you? All the person can say is no. Or mind your own business or any of that. You know, I, I'm always um, amazed at how we're so scared, I think, as a human being as, as humankind to, to we want to look the other way. We, we might see somebody crying. We have the innate op, uh, ability to see someone in distress or to see someone sad. You know, you think about your students, you can look in a classroom and immediately pick out when someone's off. Something's not right. Mm -hmm. Especially compared you know, to how they are on, you know, on the daily. Right. Right, because you get to know your students. But even if you're in a class of 300 people, if you looked at people's body languages and you just watched people standing in a line, um, I always say a train, a light rail, um, a metro, whatever you want to call it in your, in your town. If you really looked at people on a metro train and looked at what they're doing, 
what they're watching, what they're listening to, and, and really took your eye off the ball for a moment of your own phone and just looked around, you would see who's sick, who's having an off day. You, you tend to can see it in humankind. Um, I think sometimes we miss the signs or we overlook the signs because we think we're being obtrusive. I think the other thing that we have to be very willing to do um, to be a change agent is to put yourself out there. It's one of the reasons why, not that this will work for everybody, it's one of the reasons why um, I told my students when I, when I had uh, an issue and I told them I was on an SSRI. And um, I said, what do you think the dosage would be? Let's talk, let's, those of you that have had mental health. I'm just downstairs at lunch talking to them. How many of you have had mental health? And, you know, they start to raise their hands. Okay, well, when you talked in pharmacology about mental health, what did you learn? You know, what, what does an SSRI help boost? Well, it helps boost serotonin. Right, okay. So let's talk about what happens when you don't have enough. What are the symptoms? Who have you seen maybe? Who are you seeing that may be around you that you're ignoring the signs? So I think empowering people to feel that they're safe to be able to say it out loud. The rejection thing is very interesting. I, I it never really occurred to me until you said that, but that's kind of the root of all the things that we miss out on, you know, is, is that, that fear of rejection, you know, whether it's a, whether it's getting somebody's phone number, you know, like when you're young, whether it's a, whether it's like you said, going up and helping someone or, um, you know, asking, I don't know, asking for a ride or, or something like that. You know, it's always about, it's always about the, comes back to the ego and, and the rejection. You're given a master level, in my opinion, you know, and, ab and beyond, obviously, based on your education acumen. But basically, you're giving us the level that um, allows people, because the whole time I've been listening to this, I'm really trying to evaluate and I want to share something just personal. When I was younger, I was the go-to. I was the clown, right? If you, if you needed to laugh, I was your guy. If, if I saw a young lady that had her head down, she may think that I'm goofy, but she laughed in that moment. And as I've gotten older and had children and got serious about my career and I'm trying to be professional, you know, the button all the way up, sitting up straight in my chair, I've lost that. So I think what I'm hearing from you is, is that's okay to have that side of it as well. Because sometimes when you're just so what I call stuffy and professional that I feel like I need to be you lose the opportunity to connect with that person that simply just needs to laugh, simply needs to kind of be like, wow, why did you say that? I'm saying that because I can tell you need that pep in your step. And when that happens, I think that student is more likely to see the best in themselves as opposed to just going on and continuing down that path to, you know, adding the, adding the additional weight as opposed to pulling some weight off their shoulders. Yeah, I would totally agree. Sometimes that can be a small change in in the operation of, of your college. So I, I have not, I've always made this known. I call myself the tennis shoe president. So I wear athletic pants to work, um, like, um, not giving a shout out to any, you know, brand, <laughs> but like a Lululemon pullover, um, you know, a Lululemon pants or a, an athleta, very comfortable pants that, you know, aren't sloppy. They're, they're cuffed pants. And I'll wear a pair of tennis shoes every day, every day, unless I'm in a very serious meeting or I'm meeting with a board member, or I've got, I'm speaking, not even at a conference, but I'm speaking like maybe with um, an organization that I understand. I read the tea leaves or I'm in a meeting with the governor or something like that. Um, but I, have a huge tennis shoe collection and a huge t-shirt collection. And so people give me t-shirts from all over the United States. Sometimes even when they go on a travel, students will bring me a t-shirt back and I'll wear that t-shirt with a sweater and some athletic pants and some cool kicks. And what I have found is when I made that change from wearing suits every day to tennis shoes and being myself, um, it changed the whole trajectory of how students approached me. All of a sudden, I wasn't the the college president or an uh, an administrator that seemed like I was in my office. I'm walking on campus. You know, we've got 70 degrees here now in Denver, and I'm walking on campus, 
and I'm seeing students and I'm like, take a lap with me. Tell me how your class is going. Let me hear, tell me something good. I have a saying and I'll say, tell me something good. <laughs> there you go. And that you means go. you got to tell me one thing, not school related. Yep. Just tell me one good thing. I liked what a student said to me today. He said, you are never going to guess what I bought at the grocery store and ate today. I said, what? He said, a pudding cup. It was so good. I was like, no, that's telling me something good. <laughs> it could be anything, yeah. but it engages somebody in a conversation. They're still respectful. I'm not Julie, they're J Lo, their home girl. I'm Dr. Bosler. They know it. Hey, Dr. B, want to take a lap with me? I absolutely have time to take a lap. With it's me. contagious. It's literally like a virus. I mean, you know, it's you're doing that, they see it. We've got a specific dress code, I'm going to be honest, but I, I, I get it. But the application I'm going to give you is not with the dress. It's in the attitude and demeanor because in admissions, I feel like you got to be a certain way, but do you really? If a student's been here 13 months, you got different rapport with that student than someone that's walking in for the first time. So I think I could do a better job saying to you, you know, with the interaction of continuing education students and, and, and enjoy that what you're saying, you know, the path, the conversations, the camaraderie and things like that. So. Yeah. And I think students, when a student comes to your campus to see what it feels like, when a student's in high school to see what it feels like, anything, you name it, a student tries it or a person tries a new restaurant, anything in the world, they are looking at the culture of that, the feel mm. of that, right? That can't be put on. It can't be faked. I mean, you know, I like what um, the financial aid director will stop me and he'll say, oh, hey, hey. He'll say, stop, come here, come here. And I'll back up and I'll say, hey. And I always like when a student says, um, he'll say, this is Dr. Bosler. This is our college president. And the student will, you can see the slight up and down. And I'll say, <laughs> Not what you expected, huh? I'll say, I've got <laughs> way, way cooler hair, right? There you go. And then I'll make there a comment go. like, I'm a tennis shoe girl, so you're going to see me in tennis shoes, but I'm going to kick your tail with this shoe if you ever need me to kick you back in line. Make sure you graduate. And they laugh. You know, I'm trying to be funny. and But it automatically sets the tone. Don't worry. We got you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I like that tone. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, wrap it up with one more question. Okay. Um, sounds great. And this is from also we'll hit home for, for all of us really, but it's uh, from a parent of a college student and it says, my child just started college and I worry about the pressures that she will face. What signs should I look out for if they're struggling with their mental health and how can I help without being an overbearing parent? Um, first of all, there is no such thing to me as being an overbearing <laughs> yeah. parent. Um, I don't think you can be an overbearing parent. I think where parents become that term overbearing or, you know, we've heard helicopter or whatever is when a parent is not allowing their child to try to figure out their own problems, giving them the autonomy. I think we should be empowering our children to, um, what would you do instead of saying, here's what you need to do. Right. How do you feel and what what do you think you need to do to resolve the situation? So I love that this parent is already thinking of, I don't want to be overbearing. I think warning signs are different in all people, but, but here are a few things I would tell you in college. Number one is it doesn't tend to be homesickness. It tends to be silence, you know. I, I have a firm rule. I would tell my, my, ch my children in high school and in college, I don't expect you to do everything, join everything, but be part of something. Get involved on your campus, whether that be a club, a group, a flag football, intramural sport, whatever you want, but identify a group of people. Everybody needs, and I tell college students this on the first day, Look around your cohort, pick out one person in the cohort that is going to be your phone a friend at 10 o'clock at night when you say, I'm confused. Were we supposed to read chapter 11 and 12? Now I'm second guessing what the assignment is. Everybody needs that person. So 
your child needs to find somebody. That's not always your um, child's roommate. What I did for my daughters, um, my oldest daughter, is I made a banner on her dormitory door and it had her name and on um, the banner, I made it out of construction paper. It had her Instagram handle, her Snapchat handle, her Facebook handle, um, which she rarely used, her LinkedIn. And so it had all of the little icons and it said, get to know me if I'm in your class or you think you might know me or we run into each other, add me on Instagram. Let's get to know each other. I love, and then I, she had a part where it said, I love golf. She was on a golf scholarship. I love golf. I love going to Starbucks in the morning and I'm, I'm your gal because they had a Dunkin' Donuts right off their campus. If you're going for Dunkin' Donuts, I'm the gal to call. That's cool. And so that is cool. she put it out there. Everybody that's walking by her dormitory door snaps a picture of that QR code. And suddenly she's she can control who she's meeting. She can um, accept, not accept but it built a network of people. So that's a clever way to help your child get to know people. The warning signs I would tell you would be, um, um, tending to be alone, tending to um, not find anything positive, not tell me something good, um, tending to not enjoy the culture when a college student leaves a college, it tends to not be because they didn't like Arizona or I didn't like Washington State or I didn't like attending uh, in this particular field. It's rarely that people leave because they're, they don't like the field of study. What happens is they didn't feel valued in that culture. So let me say that again. Somebody didn't see the value in them. It doesn't always have to be the administrator. It can be a peer. It can be a professor. It can be the receptionist in the business building. That's who my daughter loved. She made an instant connection with the receptionist, Miss Jane, at um, the business building. It can be um, the lab um, person who sets up the labs. There's a million ways in a culture to make people feel valued. So I would also say for the parent, parent groups are wonderful to be on. Uh, my daughter had one and I was able to look up, this is a great little tip as a, for a parent, is to look up the restaurant's of the area where your child is, okay? So my daughter went to college in Philadelphia. So I did research and I picked mom and pop places, neat places that would get her, make her have to travel on the train to go to the art district yeah. or something like that. And I bought gift cards and I'd put them in an envelope. Open this when you fail an exam. Oh, Open this card idea. when you... Um, think you've met somebody you might be having pretty serious feelings for. That was like a good gift card to a really nice restaurant. Open this when you're broke and you want to take um, someone on your hallway shopping for something for nothing. And that was a Target gift card. I spent months putting those cards together. My husband wrote one. Um, when you feel like quitting golf, open this letter. So some had stickers in them. Cool. Some had um, gift cards. Some had a $5 bill. Some had a picture of her when she was five years old. Um, that is but, awesome. I love that. I know. That's tearing me up. That's tearing me up. That's that's phenomenal. I, I think what's cool is the correlation of your, your working in the schools, your education, and then those right there aren't really taught in school. That's just phenomenal stuff. Like my daughter does something simple, but they do um, polls every day. So would right. you rather have her poll when I was there was, would you rather have no nose or no feet? 
Right. And the point I'm making is, is now it's clicky and the, the girls are stopping by her floor and there's right. more tick marks and stuff. And I, I think, I think being part of something, you're absolutely right. Be part of a club, be part of something, give yourself the ability to say, man, my week kind of stinks, but Wednesday night I got Euchre club or, you know, whatever. I'm not a card player, but you know what I mean? Be part of something. I, I think there's value to that. Well, so. and, and so for this parent, I would say if there's like a, a crumble cookie, an insomnia cookie, something like that, um, my husband and I sent two dozen of cookies to my daughter's dorm and said, you have tonight to give out every cookie. You keep one and you go and give out. You have 23 cookies you have to get rid of. And I want to I want you to send us, uh, we, we have a family Snapchat. I want you to send us in our family Snapchat a picture of you with every person you gave a cookie to and tell us something great about that person. Yeah, that's cool. That's super cool. Made him, I'm sure that made her uh, quite popular at the in the dorm. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> it was so fun. She ran around like a crazy person in the dormitory. She was up on the third floor. She was running to the second floor. Then she ran outside. She called some of the guys she knew on the men's golf team. She ran to their dorm. She said, come outside. I've got something for you. She took a group picture. They're all holding a, a cookie like this and they're smiling. <laughs> the other thing that's really fun that is a fun activity to help your child is and so this will be one of the last things I'll, I'll tell you on an idea, but I love doing this. And my daughter got so embarrassed. This is a funny story. So my daughter meets this boy in college and talks about him and he friend zones her. So of course, all of the 50 something year olds at the workout place that I go to, we were all like, he friend zones her. <laughs> he friend zones her. Does he know how great she is? So we're living vicariously through my daughter's life with my women's workout group and we're talking about it. And then my daughter says, I want you to come to Philadelphia and I want to invite this friend of mine to dinner. And it's the guy. Okay. <laughs> and so she basically gives him an ultimatum. I like you. I want to be more than friends. I think you're incredible. He's on the men's golf team. She's on the women's golf team. So he brings them to dinner. Um, Great first impression. He's nervous. Everything you would want, you know, everything you want. He's asking me all the right questions. Tell me about being a college president, rah, 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 you know, all the right things. And we're sitting at dinner and we get back in the car and they drive back to the dorms separate. And my husband and I go back to the hotel in Philadelphia. And I look at my husband and I said, that boy is going to be your son-in-law. So I'm just telling you, women's intuition, that boy will be our son-in-law. So we need to now go into the next stage of she is in love with him and he is in love with her. And uh, case in point, they're uh, getting engaged. Oh, and so, be my yeah, I remember you talking about that. So that's the that's same wonderful. the same person. Okay. Same guy. And so for his birthday, I wanted, my idea was I want him to know he already has value. Now, I wouldn't do this for a high school boyfriend. I'm not that crazy right. mother. But this boy has value in my life because he values and treats my daughter well, and he's her safe haven at college, and she's thousands of miles away. So he turns 21 or 22, I think. And for his birthday, I ship him. I ask him what his address is. He tells me I ship him a ball, a saran wrap ball. And if Google it, how to make it, it is a ball that you make out of saran wrap and you wrap prizes in it. Okay. So there's chapstick and stickers and socks and everything, highlighters and notepads. And this ball gets to be like bigger than like huge, like this big. <laughs> and it weighed a ton. It cost a ton to ship. So I ship it to him and I put a note that says, happy birthday. It says, do this with your closest guy friends, okay? Your, your whoever, your closest friends. This isn't a thing I want you to do with Hannah. Hannah says, my daughter says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so embarrassed. My mother sent you this. He said, no, it was the greatest thing ever. My friends ripped it. So you roll dice and you keep unrolling the ball until you the person beside you gets doubles. And then you got to pass the ball. So everybody's trying to get the prizes out of it. A great way to send that to your child 
to have them play that with a group of people. I like that. I might do that to my daughter. I kind of like that. Lotto cards. You know, Halloween's a great thing to do it for. Any kind of thing coming up. Finals. It takes the pressure and the stress off. But it's great. Stickers. You you, And then the grand prize is like a $20 bill in the center. That's cool. And um, so that became... So not only was Hannah the coolest person ever for... But the guys played it and it became a competition and it got them all together and it builds a group of people. Because that's really what college is the first step or school, whatever, is the first taste that you have of somewhat being an adult mm -hmm. and working with a group of people who don't think like you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Julie. I, I could just talk to you for hours. You know what I mean? Oh, like... I'm just... I love being with you. Hey, I only have one regret in our interaction this evening. That I wasn't part of episode number one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> work, I appreciate it. Work that. got us. This, this was awesome. To be honest with you, I'm not afraid to tell you this. I'm a broadcasting guy. It's easy for me to talk and things. I was having a tough time formulating questions tonight because it was just, it was good stuff. And quite frankly, I need to bring a little bit of that into my day-to-day -day ops you know, in admissions, but more importantly, don't even put a title behind that. Just say as a college administrator, right? And just uh, be able to interact, be able to have the com uh, the confidence to me to have that conversation because uh, we'll talk um, off record or, or whatever, but I think Nick would agree, you know, tears were almost had by three people at the same time. And all it was, was, is, hey, you're a winner. You need to be here. We're part of a family. This is bigger than you. And Nick, I'm going to pay him confidence, you know, a uh, uh, um, kudos right here on this show that, you know, he brought the guy back in before class starts to speak with someone. And that's, that's what it's all about. You know, it's not about the titles and the hours that we work. It's the ability to shape someone's future for the better. And I think you've done a great job illustrating that tonight through your personal, uh, professional development and just caring about the student and helping them succeed and hit that, hit that ticker tape and, and go off into the next phase of their life. Well, thank you, and I appreciate it. And thank thank you to your uh, your listeners for submitting such great questions. I can't tell you I know all the answers, but I can tell you that the more we talk about it in open dialogue and the more opportunities we have to share with one another about how to be the best versions of ourselves causes us to be the best versions of ourselves for other people. And that's really what life's about is, is not so much defined by our profession. No one will remember you for your title, but people will remember you how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. that's and that's right. very powerful. Very, you yep, know, absolutely. I won't be remembered as a college president or as Avery or Hannah's mom necessarily, or the neighbor two doors down from you or someone that served on the commission or something I did or wrote or an award I won. But what I hope I'm remembered for is that I made somebody feel valued and worthwhile because I think there's value in, in all of humankind. Sure. Yeah. I have no doubt that you have changed many a life and you know, there, there's a, there's a song that um, it's like a church song and I, I can't remember how it exactly goes, but it talks about like going to heaven and then you run into people that have made differences in your, or that you've made differences in their life. And they say, Hey, do you remember me? You know, when I was in your Sunday school class, you said this and this, and that's why I'm here today, you know, just different things like that. And it, I, I love the idea of that, that you, that you can make, you know, such a difference in someone's life and not even know it. Well, I agree. And the fact that think of all the people that have made differences in our lives mm -hmm. and that have, have led us on the journey where we've ended up in, in mm -hmm. this particular moment. That's not all by chance. I right. don't think. I don't think so either. Yeah. yeah, for sure. All right. Well, Hey, we may make this like a, a semi-regular thing. Like maybe, you know, like every once in a while we'll have our, our mental health week or something, you know, and then, and do something like that. I'm, I know you're busy. You can't just, you know, <laughs> are you kidding? 
I, you invite me back anytime. I would love that. I will always say yes. So Mm -hmm. don't hesitate. The honor is all mine. I'm so honored to be a part of something that um, the two of you have done to put the word out there and just to really talk about things all over the board that, that are of human interest and that make us better human beings. So thank you. Thank you to your listeners and Nick. Um, I know we go back a ways. I can't wait till we run into each other and our paths cross again. Jason, I hope that I run into, that our paths will cross too. And thanks again. And lots of hugs to all your listeners too. And uh, keep doing wonderful things out there.